Good morning, OCA. I'm so glad to be here with you today via video. My name is Debbie Blank. I'm the director of Living Word Ministries. We are a Bible teaching ministry with a few local Bible studies focusing on in-depth, verse-by-verse study of the Word of God so that we may know God and live more for Him. We also have an international radio program where we focus on the Word of God, also on studying current events in Bible prophecy. But most importantly, I'm an OCA mom. Both of our kids started kindergarten and graduated at OCA. And next year, I'm going to be an OCA grandma as my firstborn grandchild starts at OCA. OCA has always been so important to us because we believe in a biblical, Christ-centered education for our kids, our families. It is here at OCA where you have the opportunity to learn about the world through biblical perspective, through Christ's eyes, and of course to learn about Christ and how it is to follow Him. Even though you learn these things, it's your decision what you'll do with it. Because you have a free will. You have the opportunity to choose which way you're going to go. Are you going to go the way of the Lord or the way of the world? As you move out, some of you graduating and going off to a new life for yourselves, and others of you just continuing in school, but seeing that in the near future you will be graduating, it's important for you to decide what you're going to do in life and who you're going to choose to serve. So let's pray, and then we'll get into the Word of God. Father, I thank you for each one of these students, that you have brought them to OCA, and you've given them a desire to know more about you. We pray that they will make the right choices in life to follow you and to live for you. Open our hearts today as we read your Word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to begin today by looking at Joshua in Joshua chapter 24. I'm sure you're familiar with who he is. He's the wonderful man who believed, as the other spy did, Caleb, that they could move into the promised land. Two spies followed God's direction and wanted to go into the promised land. Ten spies didn't. So because of the ten spies, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. But Joshua was faithful. When they came into the promised land, he is the one who led them into the land. As we come to Joshua 24... He has now lived his life, brought them into the land, conquered the cities, and he's ready to move on to be with the Lord. So he's giving his, you might call it a farewell address to the people. He begins in Joshua, and we're going to read verses 24, we're going to read Joshua 24, verses 14 and 15. He says, now, therefore, let's stop here for a minute. Now is taking him to the future and what he's going to suggest to them. The therefore looks back to the past of what he's just talked about. What he has just shared with them is all the things that God has done in the lives of the Israelites since they left Egypt. He gives them a snippet of remembrance of how faithful God has been, all the ways he has provided for them and what he has done for them. Let me ask you, do you take time to stop and look back? I know you may be a student and you think, well, what do I have to look back for? Maybe at how God walked you through this coronavirus, you and your family. Or maybe how God has protected you in circumstances where things could have gone wrong. Or maybe how he's taken care of your family when they've had issues that they've struggled with. It's important to remember what God has done for us. Because as we remember what he's done, we can trust him for what he's going to do in the future. So Joshua starts out by saying, now as I move on to give you instructions, I still want you to remember who God is and what he's done for you. Joshua now says to him in Joshua 24, 14, fear the Lord. That's the first instruction he gives to them is to fear the Lord. Does that mean to be afraid of God? Heavens, no. God doesn't want us to be afraid of him. Fear in this context means a reverential respect for God. Specifically, the Hebrew word is yar, which means having an awe in the presence of a holy God. When you think of God as being perfect, never making any mistakes, being pure and faithful and holy, 
We think, how can we as sinners come into the presence of a holy God? How can we fear him properly? Well, we can only do that through the blood of Jesus Christ, who brought us into a relationship with God so that we might respect him for who he is, recognize him as the creator of the universe, our sovereign God, the one who loves us, who's Lord, who's Adonai, who's the king of the universe. And he's going to return again. So do you fear the Lord? Do you respect him for who he is? Is he the key person in your life that you look to? Is he on the throne of your life instead of you and your desires? Is he the one that you use to make all of your decisions with? Or do you do what seems right in your own eyes? That's a choice you have to make. Are you willing to fear the Lord? That's the first thing Joshua said to them. Fear the Lord. And then he says in verse 14, serve him with sincerity and truth. Well, to serve him in the Greek, excuse me, to serve him in the Hebrew is a bod. It's used 18 times in chapters 24 and 25 of Joshua. Joshua sees this point of service as really important if we're going to walk with the Lord and fear him. When he's talking about service in the original language, it means to do whatever God asks you to do. In other words, obey God. But if you're going to do what God wants you to do, you first need to know what that is. And that's why you fear the Lord first. When you fear the Lord, you seek him. You seek his will above your will. And then you're willing to serve him, to obey him in that. If we're not willing to fear the Lord, then we're not going to know what he wants us to do, and therefore we're not going to do it. That's called sin. That's walking away from God. Joshua said, no, don't do this. And remember, this is the word of God. This is God-breathed word. It's not just Joshua's word. So God is telling us to first honor him by fearing the Lord, and then secondly, serving him, doing what he tells us to do. Next, he says, oh, by the way, he says, serve him in sincerity and truth. Sincerity in the Hebrew means wellness, completeness, integrity, totally devoted to God. So that's sincerity means we are willing to do whatever God wants us to do. And then when he says serve him in truth, that Hebrew word means faithfulness, complete faithfulness to whatever it is God shows us to do. You know, I've been walking with the Lord for a long time, and I'm going to tell you, sometimes it's not easy. I remember a time when God told me I had to go confess a sin to somebody, ask their forgiveness, and make restitution if necessary. That was not easy, but God told me to do it. And if I was going to have a clear conscience before God, I needed to do that, and I did. I'm telling you, it took a lot of prayer and a lot of humility. But I wanted to obey God more than anything else. So I did it. And boy, it's like a ton of bricks was taken off of my heart or my shoulders because I had cleared my conscience, had opened a door for showing respect to the other person and had obeyed God, doing what was right in his eyes. So are you going to be faithful to God? Are you going to serve him and truth, it says here, and be faithful in whatever he shows you. That's what he calls us to do. Then he tells us, number three, is we're to put away the gods which your father served beyond the river and in Egypt. Well, we don't serve those gods. We don't serve the sun god or the moon god or the 152 other gods that they had in Egypt at that time. But we have our own gods. Television, video games, internet, Twitter, being on the phone all the time, disregarding other people, putting ourselves on the throne of our lives, wanting things that perhaps are against the word of God. So our gods don't have to be the same gods of the Old Testament. They just have to be anything that takes our focus away from the real God. That's our God. For us, for me as a mom and a grandma, for a long time, my God could have been my children. They were the focus of my life. But God wanted me to have him as the center focus, the God of my life. So we have to put away those other things. We have to give them up. We have to release 
whatever it is in our lives that's important to us, release it and give it up to God and make him the center focus of our lives. Because look what happened to the Old Testament Jews when they followed other gods. Not good things. Because God is a jealous God. He wants us to follow him and no one else. It's our choice who we're going to follow. He says, put away the other gods. And then he says his number four point is serve the Lord. Oh, wait a minute. He just said that earlier. But earlier he said, serve him in sincerity and truth. So it's like he's preparing us. First, we have to have a relationship with God and focus on him and fear him. Then we have to serve him in obedience as well as being faithful. Then we have to put away all the other gods so that finally we can truly and 100% focus on God to serve him completely. Serving is very important in Joshua's book, as I told you, 18 times in these two chapters. Are you going to walk with God so that you can serve him? Well, then Joshua goes on in verse 15, and he says, Choose for yourself today whom you will serve. I ask you, choose today whom you will serve. Will it be the God of the world? Will it be yourself? Will it be the things of the world or your own busyness? Will it be college or a future or the things that you look towards? Or will it be God? Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I will tell you, after walking with the Lord for a long time, there's no greater joy than to walk with Jesus Christ, to fear him, to serve him, to obey him. So how do we do that? You know, it sounds easy, and I know that that's many of our hearts to serve the Lord, but how do we do that? Well, I'd like to take you over to Psalm 1 to give you some steps on how you can do that. Psalm 1 is a wonderful book that is, uh, has an anonymous author but gives us great wisdom here when it starts out in verse 1 by saying, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. So let's break that down a little bit. Blessed. How blessed is the man? You know, the Bible in the original languages never tells us to be happy. It tells us that we are blessed. Happiness depends on our circumstances. You got an A in a class, you're happy. You got a D, you're sad. You know, happiness is based on our circumstances where being blessed is having a right relationship with God. In the Hebrew, blessed is ashar, which means the joy of knowing I'm on the right road with God. That's what blessed means, not happy. It means I'm on the right road with God. So this psalm tells us how to be on the right road with God when it first tells us what not to do. It tells us what sin is or what will cause us to sin. When the psalmist writes, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. So we don't listen to counsel from people who don't follow the word of God. In other words, we don't listen to bad advice. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a lot of friends who sometimes want to do what they want to do. So they keep looking for advice from their friends to see what they say they should do in circumstances rather than going to God. See, right here it says, God says, do not walk in the counsel of the wicked. If you want to do the right thing, you walk in the counsel of God. You seek the counsel of godly friends, godly teachers, godly advisors, who follow the true word of God. Because if we don't, we're walking in sin. So the psalmist says, do not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Then he says, do not stand in the path of sinners. So we're not to follow that wrong advice. First, we're not to seek the wrong advice. But then if we do, or if we hear that wrong advice, we're not to follow it. When he says, do not stand in the path of sinners, it means action, standing there with people doing the wrong thing. Don't take their advice and certainly don't follow them. And then the third caution here against sinning is do not stand, excuse me, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. So don't sit down in the advice of groups. This is plural. 
Scoffers are people who don't agree with God. Oh, you don't have to follow God. That book is antiquated. The word of God isn't anything but old words from a man who wrote it. Don't listen to that. Those are scoffers who don't know the truth. If you've been in the word of God, you know it's true. It's the only plumb line by which we as Christians can follow or anyone in the world should follow. There's no other book that's God breathed. There's no other book that was written by God, by 40 authors, 66 books, over 1,500 years, and yet the same theme throughout from Genesis to Revelation. The same God wrote it. It's all about redemption. Jesus Christ redeeming sinners so that we might have eternity with God. That's the theme of the book. Are you going to listen to the scoffers? If we do, it's because we want to do what they talk about. We want to walk in sin. We choose to walk in sin when we sit in the seat of scoffers. So the psalmist says, don't take their advice, don't follow them, and don't listen to groups or join groups of people who turn away from the Lord. That's really good advice if you want to choose the Lord. But it's not just what we don't do, it's what we should do. So the psalmist goes on to tell us what to do. He says in verse 2, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Is your delight in the law of the Lord? Do you enjoy getting to the word of God, to learn about God, to know God, to find out what he tells us to do or how we're supposed to live? Just think of it. Psalm 119.11 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. How can we know what direction to go in life if we don't know and follow the truth of the word of God? Hebrews 4.12 reminds us that the word of God is living and active. That means no matter who you are, what age you are, what walk you have with the Lord, it's living, it touches all of our lives. So what God speaks to me about is different than what he speaks to you about from his word. But that's because I'm at a different age and a different place in life. But it's living and active. It meets all of us at our point of need. Hebrews 4.12 goes on to say, And it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and able to pierce the division of soul and spirit and joint and marrow. In other words, the word of God penetrates every aspect of our lives. And then it's able to discern the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. Nobody else, nothing else can do that. Only the Word of God. Word of God is powerful. It's living, the Bible says. It is what teaches us about God so that we can learn about the true God, not what people tell us about God, not what we think or experience or portray God as being because he's like our Father. Oftentimes we think God is like our Father at home. We learn about the real God. We learn what he really did and what he really wants and what his heart is and his character. Word of God is powerful. I love the word of God because it teaches me about God. I learned a lot of other stuff too. I've got a lot of minutia in this head and a lot of history from the Bible. But most importantly, it teaches me about God, the God that I'm going to spend eternity with. So get back. It's your delight in the law of the Lord. In his law, we are to meditate day and night. Meditate is an interesting word that means chew the cud. If you understand that, you know that a cow has three stomachs. That means that every time they eat grass, they chew it up and they swallow it. And then later on, they'll bring that food back up. They'll chew it again and they'll swallow it in their second stomach. Then when they feel like it, they'll bring the grass up a third time chew it up, and swallow it again. Well, that sounds pretty gross to us, but that's what we do with the Word of God. We meditate on it. So we don't just read it, but we think about it. And then a little bit later, we bring it back up and we meditate on it some more. We think about it some more until we finally have digested the Word of God to the point that we can use in our lives. That's what meditate is. So first of all, we delight in the Lord. Secondly, we meditate on it. And if we do, we are like a tree firmly planted by rivers of water, which yield its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever we do, we prosper. 
So think about that. A tree needs water to thrive. And the more water it has, the deeper the roots go. In our case, the deeper the roots go in God. And the deeper the roots go, the more beautiful the tree grows. The more leaves, the more fruit the tree has on it. And the more beneficial it can be for this world and for God. So today I ask you, who are you going to serve? Are you going to choose the God of the world and all the things of the world and the way you want to go? Are you going to choose the way of the Lord? It's your decision, but your eternity is going to depend on the decisions that you make today. Let's pray. Father, I pray that each one of these students will hear you today in Joshua 24 and in Psalm 1, and they will choose to delight themselves in the law of the Lord. They will choose you over the world, and they will be blessed. They will know the joy derived from knowing they're on the right road with God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.